Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, webinar, a special uh, uh, episode with, uh, with Rohit Sareen on uh, the subject of demystifying asset allocation and how to weather against Indian equities extreme volatilities. Um, so like I said, uh, the special guest, uh, uh, Rohit, I'll take a minute to introduce. Um, Rohit is the co-founder of Client Associates, um, a very well-known uh, wealth management outfit um, in India, started by him and his colleague Himanshu Kohli about, what, 20 years ago. Uh, so it's a long, uh, long time in today's, uh, today's measurement. Um, Rohit has rich experience across family offices, private banking, as well as uh, corporate finance. He's worked at uh, quite a few illustrious organizations such as Deutsche Bank, uh, ANZ, and Kotak prior to going off to start Client Associates. And the special event uh, uh, now is that he's recently authored a book called Unlocking Wealth Secrets to Getting Rich at Any Age. So we'll spend a lot of time trying to understand his thoughts behind this book. So with that, um, Welcome to you. Uh, welcome to Rohit. Uh, welcome to this special episode of uh, of Marcellus webinar. Thank you, uh, Prabod. Uh, thank you for your uh, kind opening remarks. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to to be hosted by you. Thank you for inviting. Looking forward to the conversation. Pleasure is all mine. <clears throat> so we'll start with your journey. I've just given some snippets, but uh, if you can tell us in your own words. Um, you've worn different hats as a private banker, or as a corporate financier, as an entrepreneur, now as an author. Um, just tell us a little bit about your journey, how you got where you've gotten to. Uh, well, this is a question, you know, which I can talk about for the next two hours, but I think for in the interest of time and also the audience, I would like to give a summarized answer to this because he we started client associates in 2002 so it's been a long journey of 22 years but before that pretty much uh, like uh, the middle class indians wanting to become first generation entrepreneurs i started my career in 95 in the banking industry and that too in the corporate finance industry with the kotak group uh, incidentally because that time there was no wealth management industry in india so you know, corporate finance was basically where everybody wanted to start and started off with that. So, and as it would happen organically on any journey, so I was always interested in, you know, investment. So at that point in time, a bank called Lanes at Grindley's Bank was wanting to launch their wealth management business in India. And they were here, you know, from Australia, their expat team to hire, hire the startup team. So I was lucky enough to be hired as part of that startup team to launch wealth business in India for ANZ. Uh, and I happened to be, you know, I call myself lucky because I was the only one who came from a non-investment background. So I was the only one from the corporate finance background. And then two years down the line, ANZ sold the business to Standard Chartered Bank. Then I moved to Deutsche Bank's private wealth business, uh, private wealth management division. And that was a time at the beginning around 2000, foreign banks used to dominate uh, the consumer side of the market in India, you know, like Citibank, Standard Chartered, HSBC, Deutsche Bank, ANZ. Uh, they had started ramping up their wealth management business in India. So so that's how typically with the dawn of 2000, you know, the wealth management industry started uh, kind of shaping up in India. And these were the two banks where I learned about wealth management and the way it is done in the developed world. And that's where, you know, I learned that as India will get richer, uh, you know, Indian society will have a new problem to solve, which is manage those riches and a new market will get created. And to solve that problem, you know, there is a, there could be a new entrepreneurial opportunity to create a professional platform, which could provide access to this new market to global best practices as they are available to global wealthy families. So, so can we provide access to going to be rich, wealthy Indian families to global best practices here in India. So that was that was the dream, that was the vision we started with. And since then, we've grown organically over the last 22 years. We are now a team of about close to 260 people across to 10 offices in as many cities in India. And we work with close to about 1,200 plus unique wealthy families uh, advising assets, uh, roughly about $6.1 billion. Uh, so that's uh, been the summary of our journey. Of course, there can be many more things. 
No, it's phenomenal. Every time you talk about getting lucky, um, I think uh, it, it, it shows a sense of humility. Extremely important in our profession, you would agree, that we need that role of luck to play. But um, I must say your thought of building a family office is way ahead of its time uh, on two counts. Um, one is, um, you know, you talked about wealth creation in the country. You know, Indians have always created wealth, but most of that wealth has been parked in real estate and, and gold where you and I didn't have much to do. Okay. Uh, it's only the last decade. I remember Saurabh wrote that seminal piece about uh, how India is going to financialize its savings exactly 10 years ago, uh, literally after the first uh, time Mr. Modi got elected. Um, and how has it transpired? I'm sure you would have experienced the benefits of that. So have we and pretty much everybody in the wealth management space. But more importantly, what you mentioned about conflicts of interest, I think that is really way ahead of its time, even today. Uh, even today, a lot of the wealth management is sort of glorified distribution in the country to have thought through aligning of interests with, um, with the clients uh, way back 20 years ago. Uh, you know, full full credit to you. And now we can see at the margin, the rest of the wealth management space is also moving towards that sort of a client first advisory model. Now let, let's move to the sort of uh, important uh, point in your career where you've, uh, you know, newly minted author. Uh, congratulations, first of all, for that. Uh, many of us struggle to write a page, you've written a whole book. Um, so let's, uh, let's dig deep into what triggered your um, your desire to become an author and tell us more about what's in the book, why um, getting rich at any age is, is not that difficult. Yeah. You know, first of all, thank you for, uh, you know, for your, you know, kind appreciation. And uh, so I'm just a novice in this. I think you and Saurav have been accomplished authors, experienced authors. So there is more for me to learn from authors like you. Then what I can tell, you know, but to answer your question, see, I've always, right from my, you know, school days, my, you know, I've always been fond of writing or, you know, converting my expression through way of writing. But that doesn't mean that I can, you know, I have it in, in me to become an author. I think the credit of this, I would give to uh, several stakeholders. Uh, first of all, uh, I think I would like to begin with my family because they knew who I am and, you know, how I like to express. So they've always been encouraging me to you know, embark upon this project. Then I would say, you know, within the team, you know, people I work with at client associates, you know, some of them have been encouraging me that well, this is something you must do. You must do because they also know who I am. So a lot of credit goes to them also. And then thirdly, and lastly, and most importantly, I would like to give credit to my publishers. So they've been encouraging me for some years now. That Rohit, you should do this, you should do this. And uh, finally, last September, they again approached me. And this time I thought this time to bite the bullet because otherwise I'll just keep on procrastinating. It'll never happen. If they are the one who are in the business, they think I can do it, then I might as well trust their wisdom than trusting my wisdom. And that's how it happened that finally I, I put pen to the paper and it happened. So that's how it happened. And, and you know, what is, uh, I think your second part of your question was what the book is all about. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So, it's a very simple thought process. You know, it's my belief. And I think that the uh, belief of a lot of Indians as well, including, I guess, must be yours as well, that I, I genuinely feel, very strongly feel that next 10 years or more uh, could be India's best years in this entire century in terms of growth. So India is going to go through a multiplier effect. The scale will tip. Uh, after that, also growth will keep happening. But I think the next 10 years, the multiplier effect is going to be witnessed by all of us. So, so if our economy typically, you know, grows 3x in the next 10 years, and that's a simple math in rupee terms, if you're growing at about 11, 12%, it will become 3x. You know, that's a very simple math. It's not imagination. Uh, and if that is an average growth of a country, an average growth of a class, then well-managed businesses, which are doing above average, they are performers, they're outperformers, outstanding performers. Uh, if they compound their business at about 18 to 20% per annum next 10 years, uh, a business, regardless whether large or small, any business in India which is managed well can become six to seven times in the next 10 years. Right. Again, there's a simple math behind, behind it. And if that happens, then that will lead to a massive wealth creation opportunities for all skills and stakeholders. 
So that was my thought that this is a time, the timing is absolutely apt to send out the message for creating affluence in India that every Indian, uh, you know, should think of becoming a wealth creator and need not be only entrepreneurs. It need not be only billionaires or industrialists. It could be a student who could be a future wealth creator. It could be even people, you know, working in our, you know, our domestic staff. Anybody who is wanting to grow, uh, you know, do do whatever they're doing better than others. You know, they they have this exceptional opportunity over the next 10 years to become wealth creators. So I thought that I, if I can, you know, come out with a book which is meant for every Indian, be it a student, be it a billionaire. Uh, so that was the motivation and that concept, you know, uh, when I presented to the publishers, it was liked by them. And they thought that, yes, there's a market for it and this will get go down accepted pretty well because this is their business, right? So so this is all then. And then other things kept falling in place one after the other. Coming back to the wealth creation that you talked about in relationship with the growth in the economy and the sort of growth in the size of the various businesses that automatically, you know, talks about equities and, and India, Indians generally love their stock markets and equities, but wealth creation is beyond just the returns, um, which is where, you know, I wanted to, you know, pick your brains on how you think about other asset allocation, uh, asset classes and, and the concept of asset allocation where the interaction between various asset classes can actually deliver better risk adjusted returns. Something, um, you know, very alien to us. We are a single asset class manager. We only do equities. Um, but would love to hear uh, your approach to how do you go about advising clients on various asset classes? A very good question, uh, Pramod. So see, in our role, as you already mentioned that, you know, see, what is our core role? Our core role, see, you are asset managers. So that is your core function. Uh, our core function is we are asset allocators. Right? So that's our core function. As a subset of that, we may do manager selection as well that, you know, under different asset classes. Once you've done the asset allocation, then under different asset classes, we would want to construct a model portfolio, best in class asset manager, and not just a model portfolio, but the most efficient portfolio across the top decile managers of India. That's the brand promise that our client's money would be invested with the top decile managers of India uh, in a portfolio, which is the, would be the most efficient portfolio uh, uh, in India. <clears throat> then the extension of further a subset extension of that is once you've done asset allocation, you've done manager selection, then tactical allocation, because you know, as asset managers, you manage that on your side is that markets, financial markets, they go through cycles, right? Uh, while long-term investing is certainly there, and I'm not even suggesting market timing, but the real opportunity for an intelligent investor lies in tactical allocation, which could happen, you know, once, even once in a year is more than enough. So it's nowhere close to trading, it's nowhere close to market timing. But it's simply being overweight and underweight on an asset class where you think that going forward next 12 to 24 months, the cycle is going to be more favorable. So I think that has been uh, our core function. And then uh, under various asset classes, see, uh, when, when, we, when we advise clients, uh, there are broad two categories of asset classes, you know, which you can bucket into. So one are growth asset classes where you would like to compound your wealth, where the goal of compounding wealth for a client is can be met. So those are typically growth asset classes. Certainly listed equities is one of them. Unlisted equities are also now coming up in India, which is another one of them. Uh, certain parts of real estate is also another one of them because see, as the economy grows, it gets reflected in real estate. So maybe the residential part of real estate also mirrors that more than commercial. And then the second bucket of asset classes is more, which are which are more meant to achieve the protection goal of clients. Because see, clients, when when they have to manage their family wealth, they largely have these two strategic goals, which is protection and growth, right? And they would like to kind of straddle between the two because, um, you know, they are rich and they would like to stay rich. So that's where the protection thing comes from. But at the same time, they understand and appreciate the importance of compounding because that is the biggest wealth creator over a long period of time. So that's where that can only come from growth asset classes. So depending upon our con conversation with clients and their, their mandate and their expectations, you know, we first arrive at the asset allocation, which is for them. It is not generic, it's for them. 
and then once that piece has been fixed you know and has been recorded as part of the mandate then the next level of you know detail starts coming in that who are going to be the uh, managers under respective asset classes once the portfolio has been invested then the tactical guidance and allocations comes comes into play so that's where the process plays out in one of your recent articles uh, you mentioned about not only you know diversifying between asset classes which have low correlation but also thinking about diversifying geographically uh, can you can you share some idea like you know where do you see opportunities and why do you think that is important yeah so i think that's a very uh, you know one of the core uh, investing principles you know diversification i think you as investment professionals and we as wealth advisors you know we we understand that that you know the good old maxim that don't put all your eggs in one basket right so i think that's where it comes from so diversification can happen at various levels so at one level as i just explained is it can happen across asset classes right so if you put your all your money into one asset class let us say only equities so then you are exposing your wealth uh, to a lot of volatility right and it could also lead to wealth erosion you know if the cycle is not in your favor or a black swan event happens just after you put the money likewise if you put all your money into 100% fixed income or protection asset class also that is also the risk of the opportunity cost of losing on compounding and growth right so you will just be able to keep pace with inflation uh so i think concentration risk of each asset class you know doesn't bring in efficiency to to uh, to the management of assets so that is where diversification helps it basically it is it is not a bridge to maximize your returns right so that is what we always you know kind of uh, tell our clients and anybody diversification is a, is a, is a bridge to minimize the volatility of the portfolio right right so you are not trying to maximize the return by 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 diversifying so likewise you know diversification as you mentioned about geography also it can happen you know across asset classes within an asset class it can happen across managers across investing styles across strategies likewise it can also happen across economies across currencies right uh, because if you look at the global scale you know within the global economy there are different economies right so india is doing very well in one of the fastest growing large economies of the world so could be others also right today there may not be too many of them but then it doesn't mean that there is nobody else in the world which is growing other than india so uh, the concept of correlation is a is a, i would say is a technical concept you know which is like the bedrock of diversification principle which says that it makes sense to combine uh, two asset classes or regions or strategies which are poorly correlated with each other right for example even within the same asset class for example in equities listed equities to understand the principle very similarly if let us say you put in your money in two large cap indices right underlying stocks are going to be the same there's zero diversification although the managers are different right so they have a perfect correlation there's no point diversifying across attributes which have perfect correlation right it makes sense to diversify only if there is a poor, poor correlation so for example between gold and equities there is a poor correlation likewise across geographies for example maybe india and the us they 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 could not they could be less than one correlation may not be poor correlation because typically when in the times of crisis you know the correlation is every asset class is correlated with each other but that's only exceptional situations you know on a non going basis you know cycles play out in different economies and the timing of those cycles they they interject with each other they are not the same they don't overlap and that's that is where the element of poor correlation or a lower correlation comes in so for example simple thing is you set up a business one business does well say in the in the month of summers and let us say and one business does well in the winters in a in a region which is of extreme climate like north india so if you only have one business then you will be sitting idle for 6 months but if you have two businesses once one business is low the other will pick up so they have a poor correlation so likewise i think in investing also if you are diversifying uh, even across regions uh, where markets which have a poor correlation with india uh, it will help 
to bring an efficiency into the portfolio it may not and need not maximize the returns but it will definitely be able to help the investor to earn the same return at a lower risk so the quality of the mm-hmm. returns and and the risk with the investor is taking to to kind of achieve the same return actually goes down so so that is where it helps you know improving the efficiency of the portfolio no in fact um, i think you mentioned tactical asset allocation mm-hmm. if you add tactical asset allocation to diversification you may actually in fact increase the returns also because you would have ended up keeping some dry powder which can be put to use during a drawdown as opposed to sitting on a single asset class in fact I'm glad you mentioned us and india correlations um, I, would, I would ask arindam to drop he wrote a research paper recently which showed significantly low correlation for us and indian equities which was a bit counterintuitive to me because i was in the same uh, camp as yours that given foreign inflows flow together into assets and out of assets i would have thought india and us are more correlated but uh, anand do you want to share some thoughts with uh, rohit on what what you found in that research paper yeah absolutely uh, so i mean look i'm this research paper was kind of uh, Uh, i would say hinted by uh, one of our current clients actually uh, so they are actually foreign investor and they wanted to invest in india so their point was that exactly the same that it is the equity market at the end of the day so you know this market should be correlated so we just ran a three year rolling correlation between nifty 50 and s&p 500 over last 15 years uh, surprisingly i mean if i take any other equity index like say msci em emerging or msci japan europe etc the correlation between s&p 500 and nifty 50 was the lowest among the major equity indices uh, more interestingly I, as you mentioned like the gfcs or covid those are like you know global events you actually cannot do anything with those if you take out those extreme periods the correlation actually drops meaningfully now to dig further what you did is like okay let us see uh, the months when snp was down what the indian market was doing what, can i run a correlation on that so if i take out those extreme you know events and some of the down months because that was one of the requests that one of our clients had the correlation actually drops the correlation drops meaningfully to around i think 15 or 20% I and mean, there was actually big big shocker now uh, the thing is that uh, you have these two best markets i mean if you look at historical returns right 10 20 30 year uh, historical historically best markets and if you combine them uh, as you mentioned the risk actually drops meaningfully uh, you know the because the us market is much less volatile compared to the indian market i mean if i look at the volatility of indian market it is around 21 22% us is around 12 13 so combine them the risk drops meaningfully the drawdowns drop meaningfully so if you look at any global crisis gfcs or uh, you know covid uh, if you look at indian market and us market then us market holds up much better because partially because you know the dollar is kind of considered a safe haven so it it holds up its value and iron also depreciates at the same time um so the risk adjusted return over a long period of time and you don't have to do any fancy things just every year just make sure that you have a reasonable allocation in both these markets uh the risk adjusted return actually get boosted by around 30 to 40% which was kind of an eye opener i mean i never thought that that would be the outcome when you started the exercise yeah so it's, it's quite phenomenal actually i mean you get better return at lower risk uh, which is sort of counterintuitive because we all thought that uh, to get higher returns you need to take higher risk but uh, that's the magic of diversification and asset allocation um so rohit you arindam and i all understand the benefits what about uh, your clients uh, how are they get, are they open to investing in globally compared to where they were say 5 10 years ago do they appreciate the benefits of diversification and if yes what are the avenues for them to invest where do you recommend your your clients invest globally uh, yeah pramod so what has happened in india see the 10 years back uh, the acceptance of uh, diversification beyond india was very very low uh, in fact uh, you know there is always a time in the cycle of a market's growth and development and you know the market is ready for an idea 
So perhaps that time the market was not ready for this idea. And then, you know, a few things have to happen. So in the last 10 years, what has happened is that India's economy has grown linked to that India's stock market valuations have grown linked to that client's wealth have grown. So if the scale of private wealth in India has grown, so at that point in time, you know, it has crossed a threshold where now clients start understanding the importance that I'm with this scale of wealth, I'm exposed fully to India's economy. It is now important for me to start, you know, looking at beyond India. So this is one change which has happened. The second change is also, see, even if 10 years back, somebody who was kind of, somebody like you, who in any case, was knowledgeable enough that it makes sense to diversify beyond India, but then the options were very limited, right? The range through which you could do that were very, very limited. So I, I think those, the supply side has also grown. So today, so there are two, two ways in which, uh, you know, clients could diversify in India now. So one is the channel of the feeder funds, which are available uh, to Indian domestic Indian investors, and they need not, you know, bother about the LRS limits for that. And even the post taxation, you know, post budget, the taxation of that has become more efficient than what it used to be earlier. And of course, the second route is uh, of uh, the LRS, which has always been there for a long period of time. So while there is more appreciation for it, uh, but what has happened is that the limits on the LRS have not kept in pace with the growth of scale of wealth in India on the private hands. Right. So let us say a client who used to be a 10 crore client today, maybe a 25, 54 client today. But then the LRS limit is continues to be the same what it used to be even 10, 15 years back. Right. And what and 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 at that scale of lifestyle and needs, a good part of that LRS limit, you know, gets utilized and consumed for their other purposes, for example, education of their children, maybe their lifestyle expenses if members of the family are staying there travel and so on and so forth, right? So then only a partial limit can, which is left can be utilized for diversifying, you know, beyond India. And uh, and there is there is a case for looking at revision of that limits and I'm sure it will be on, on the drawing boards of the, of, of the policy of the government. And uh, so that at this point in time, uh, I see that as a restriction in terms of client's ability to actually go beyond uh, you know, to diversify, you know, uh, their portfolios in true sense. So now that's the challenge we're also saying. Um, so we have a global portfolio out of Gift City. Uh, it's a modest portfolio, again, catering within that $250,000. I understand there is some plans for setting up this OPI where Indian corporates can invest larger sums in, uh, in funds overseas. But um, well, let's see how that goes. Um, but just one thought from Arindam on this global investing piece. Arindam, you've studied in the U.S., you've lived in the U.S., you've invested in the U.S. Often um, the pushback is that, look, India is the fastest growing large economy in the world. Why would you want to invest elsewhere, particularly given everybody sees the U.S. economy slowing down? Um, you know, yes, we might have uh, sort of escaped a recession, but even in the best of health, the U.S. economy growth has been what three percent in real terms compared to seven percent in India. So why, why bother investing in the U.S.? Uh, what do you have to share from your experience? Uh, yes, Pramod. I mean, that is a great question. And uh, to be very honest, I mean, when I started my career, uh, so back in 2009-10, I mean, emerging market was actually its big boom. Actually, so everyone loved emerging markets. You know. Uh, uh, everyone is to kind of brag about that, but the point is, uh, in reality, if I if I look at the th last 30, 40, 50 years of history and just take out the data, uh, and the correlation between economic growth and stock market return, those are actually there. There is not much of correlation beyond one or two countries, maybe. Uh, I mean, China is a classic example. It has probably been by far the fastest growing country in the last 30 years. If you look at the repeated markets, that hasn't done much. Uh, not only China, if you look at Philippines, if you look at Indonesia, those are also at times actually growing faster than India. But the equity markets haven't delivered much. Uh, so I think it goes back to the basic principle. Uh, countries where you can find that you know companies with good governance, good earnings per share, and return on equity more than cost of equity. 
uh, ironically very few countries actually can deliver that so from that standpoint india is actually pretty pretty well positioned in fact the more you study other emerging market countries you find that india why india stands out and i haven't said that uh, india's growth story is unbelievable and i i allude to what uh, rohit was saying in terms of the future potential for next 10 years uh, but that is nothing new to be very honest I and mean, if you look at last 30 years indian gdp has compounded at around uh, even in us dollar term it has grown 13x in last 30 years uh, if i look at us gdp uh, it has grown i think 4x in last 30 years but if you look at the stock market return the us market has given you much higher return compared to the indian market so the point you know uh, goes back to again the basic fact that uh, if a country is evolving enough to keep pace with the changes that are happening you know around you then you can keep on delivering the growth as long as the institutions are strong enough to to make sure that you are actually profiting from the latest changes that is happening in the world and us kind of sits very nicely in that zone not many other actually not many developed countries have been able to pull it off if you look at uk i mean there are many other developed countries that we can point out there is no growth and they are not actually producing the new generation leaders but for us that has not been the case right uh, in fact if you look back every 20 years the top 10 companies in s&p 500 keep on changing there is a very very unique feature of the us economy and as long as they can continue to do that the value creation would likely to continue over a long period of time it's an unbelievable run uh, the us has had Uh, but india is uh, no less particularly in the last 4 years uh, to the extent that um, you know some of us struggle to find uh, value in the indian market today um so on that note um, rohit as a closing comment what are you telling clients today given where equity markets are last i heard was there are at least 250 stocks in the bse 500 which are trading at 50 times earnings or more um our own analysis of cyclically adjusted pe shows that the bse 500 is actually trading at a higher cap than the 2008 january peak uh, which is something like 45 times Um, which is anecdotally seen by our analysts who sort of struggle to find um, high IRR or TSR uh, uh, stocks in the market. So, given where we are in Indian equities, how uh, what are you advising clients in terms of asset allocation, uh, India versus global? You know, so so we follow. You know, we answer these questions. You know, uh, as an outcome of a process, which is a model that we have developed, and we've been you know running that uh, for the last eight and a half years. I mean, and we built a satisfactory track record in terms of the accuracy of that so basically we come out with a overweight underweight or neutral stance you know various parts of the market market as a whole uh, so since uh, september of last year we have been underweight on mid to small cap segment of the market and i know there's a lot of money has been made in the last one year 11 months on that side but you know nobody can time the market so when we say that we are underweight basically our guidance is no further allocation into that segment of sub asset class at these valuations right so we don't say that you exit the existing one so maybe the clients existing allocations have participated in in that upside in the last one year but we don't want our clients fresh assets to go uh, in assets which may be the best assets in the world but where they are available very expensive because you'll never make money in them even on a 10 year basis so that's one but you know having said that the valuations of the top 100 50 maybe largely top 50 is still they are in line with long term averages and the reason for that is that the large caps have not participated in this liquidity driven rally over the last 18 months uh, as much as the mid and small caps have and the reason for that is largely it is driven by the liquidity which is coming to the markets from domestic investors fpis have not really allocated much participated much over the last 18 months and who are the ones who participate more in the large cap stocks so i think that's a cycle waiting to be unlocked so we are neutral on that and so if a client wants to allocate fresh funds today towards equity asset class first of all we say neutral and within that we say okay that should go to large caps and not in small and mid caps very interesting i think it helps it helps to be systematic in your approach that you have a plan and, and let the plan take that action rather than 
our very biased human mind trying to take actions when you know things are at extreme uh, we know how that turns out we end up taking exactly the uh, wrong call so having a systematic approach to asset allocation is definitely better um and and you talked about the us being a narrow market i think um, the low correlation of us and india shows in many ways right so we talked about india moving from small cap to large cap whereas us is exactly at the opposite stage but much of the growth has been led by a handful of large tech That's companies right. whereas the small caps have been left in the lurch uh, guess the us small cap small mid caps are trading at all time lows in terms of historical valuations where it's exactly the opposite in india right. um on that note i'd like to thank you rohit thanks for your time appreciate it and all the best for the book and for all the listeners we will have the link to the book the book is now available uh, on amazon it should start getting delivered by 10 september is what rohit tells me you can find the link to the book in the in the show notes um thanks to everyone for joining in and most importantly thanks to rohit and anandam for their Uh, for their interesting perspectives thank you pramod thank you arindam for having me i enjoyed my conversation with you thank you